Okay, hello everyone. Let's get started. Um, so, um, I think uh, I'll do the presentation first, and straight afterwards, uh, still in this room, we have a birds of a feather session. We're just gonna open the open the mic to the floor, and everybody can talk about um, what they want to talk about. We have a few discussion topics around self-driving car space and the open source uh, software's place in that self-driving um, industry. Um, but to start with, um, I will introduce to you um, the stuff that ARM has been working on uh, on the open source self-driving stack. Uh, I haven't been working on this for very long, uh, but I'm going to show you what we got so far. So my name is Liu Zhou, and I work in the open source software department inside ARM. Um, I am in a team called Safety Critical Machines, so work on things uh, related to automotive, and within that includes the uh, open source self-driving stack that is called AutoWare. And I'm here to share um, some of the re uh, insights and some of the work we have done on the project AutoWare. So AutoWare is a open source project. It has a foundation. ARM um, joined the foundation uh, sometime last year. It was end of last year as a funding member. Uh, and you can see there are loads of other industrial heavyweights inside this foundation. You have Xilinx and... Um, um, I think Xilinx is here with Linaro. And I think Linaro is also a founding member inside the foundation. Um, the, the project itself um, started from university in Japan, Nagoya. And um, it is a collection of functionalities that enable you to build a, build a, a self-driving system. So the university itself has done a lot of research projects using this framework. They have built uh, demonstration vehicles uh, using, I think, Toyota um, platforms and um, have, have shown, demonstrated to drive around in Japan. Uh, but um, when I first look at the, the, the uh, architecture of the platform, it looks very, very messy. It is a spider web of interconnected bits uh, all um, pushing and pulling information. So how do, you, uh, how do you start doing work on these sort of things? So ARM's objective on this is we want to be able to run all that functionality on the ARM-based platform and hence promote the use of um, ARM platform and chips. Hence, we need to pull out from this very messy diagram what is really the um, the, the big um, big users of your system. So, which are the resource-heavy bits? So, we had a look at this, um, and it comes down to three bits of the whole system. So, the first bit is localization. So, what localization is is when you're driving along you need to be able to know uh, any, at any time where yourself is within a map. And in order to do that, you have some sensors to help you. So first of all, you have your GPS uh, that tell you roughly to uh, within a few meters of where you are. And then you can have your um, IMU that help you to do dead reckoning, so keep track of where you have been. But in order to do true self-driving, you probably need the accuracy of a few centimeters. That's when the LiDAR comes in. So the LiDAR will take a scan of your environment, and uh, it will try to match that to a preloaded scan of the map. So, so you're basically uh, matching a 3D image onto a portion of another 3D image. And this process uses an algorithm called NDT matching. And we will talk about that later in more detail. But at the same time, there's another um, 
sensor that can help you, which is your camera. So um, Stacks, developed by Tesla and uh, NVIDIA, does this. They look at your camera stream and find interesting points inside your camera. For example, you can find, find stream la uh, street lamps, you can find intersections, uh, crosswalks, and stuff like that, and match these points to uh, a labeled map. So the map will be labeled with where the street lamps are and stuff like that. Then using that information, you can also accurately localize yourself to a few centimeters. And that is very uh, resource heavy, uses a lot of CPU, a lot of matching, uh, process a lot of points, and we'll have a look at that later. And the second big area that is very compute heavy is perception. So what this does is uh, the the self-driving car needs to detect its environments. So it needs to recognize where there are cars, where there are people, where there are pavements, and figure out where is a drivable road, uh, detect lanes, detect traffic lights, that sort of thing. So um, here it comes down to two sensors. One is your camera. You might have multiple. And for detecting objects in, inside the camera, you usually use uh, a machine learning approach. So that means you are running a neural network, convolutional neural network, to detect objects. Uh, on the other hand, you could also use um, LiDAR um, and run object detection algorithms on your LiDAR scan. And there, uh, in that space, there is an algorithm called Euclidean clustering, and we will have a look at that later as well. And then finally, uh, there is planning. So there's mission planning, which means you're planning a predefined route from your current location to a destination, so kind of like what Google Map does. And there's uh, mission planning. Now, now, mission planning is very um, ahead of time, so you plan your route before you set off. So there's less real-time requirements on that. But there's also motion planning, which plans your route for the next few seconds. So it's in charge of deciding whether you want to change lane, whether you want to overtake, you want to make a turn, or you want to stop at traffic lights. So these sort of uh, so mission planning is actually very time critical, and hence it does take up a large amount of computing resources. Now let's break down some of the algorithms in these and see how we can best run them on ARM platforms and how we can accelerate them. Uh, first thing we looked at is perception. Um, so we looked at the visual part of perception, which is, uh, which is using a camera input and try to detect objects within the camera input using um, using convolutional neural networks. And as you know, machine learning has been such a hot topic, there is a readily available a bunch of open source software and, and hardware uh, that's going to help you accelerate these workloads. So uh, first of all, the algorithm itself, uh, neural networks, it's just a large number of floating points uh, operations or integer operations if your network is an integer-based network. And they have a fixed uh, delay. So from your input, your image into a network until the uh, end of your network and your result come out, there is a fixed amount of delay in that. Um, doesn't matter how many objects you detect, it's always going to be a fixed amount of delay. And so ARM offer these few pieces of hardware that's going to help you run these type of workloads. First thing is CPU, obviously, um, but with a vector, vector extension. So, so your CPU has certain vector capabilities that help you do a matrix multiplication that's going to accelerate these type of workloads. Um, secondly, Mali GPU supports OpenCL, so you can use OpenCL to accelerate workloads. Pretty simple there. Um, then finally, ARM does offer a, a machine learning processor IP that is um, 
that is actually a graph runner. So you, you insert the entire graph into your neural processor and it will accelerate. Um, it will run the workloads at accelerated speed. But we're software engineers, we don't deal with hardware. We want all these things to be abstracted. So here are the software IPs that we can use. Uh, ARMN, um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. It's, um, it's a framework that allow you, uh, allow you, allow you to input uh, models trained by a lot of machine learning frameworks. So you have your TensorFlow, your, your PyTorch, and you generate a network, uh, give it to ARMN, it will pass the network and dispatch to the appropriate hardware on your platform. And that's very nice. And also you have the uh, ARM compute library which gives you more, um, more uh, low level primitives like matrix multiplication, sort of um, edge detection in your computer um, vision space and allow you to do more hand um, optimized code. And based on these, we made a demo. Uh, so here is um, our stack, which you can see. Uh, we have a, um, to tie it back to AutoWare as a project, we have made a AutoWare com compatible vision detection node. Uh, it is uh, written as a ROS node, so it's running on top of ROS, uh, communicating with other ROS, ROS nodes. And uh, you can see here we're using uh, Docker as our container and running on Linux um, and finally on uh, graphics accelerated hardware. So CPU and GPU. Um, and you can see that in the demo booth later today. And, um, and you can see, I don't know whether you can click. And you can see on the left is the input stream, on the up, uh, right is the output stream where there are cars and peoples being detected on the road. And this is a video that's recorded by the self-driving car in Japan. Now, we also look at another node. Apart from detecting people and cars, we need to detect traffic lights. So we had a look at traffic light detection. This is also traditionally running um, neural networks, um, often CUDA accelerated. Um, so there are different approaches to this problem. So in the original AutoWay implementation, the, the traffic, light, traffic light detection is heavily reliant on you having a really detailed annotated map. Uh, what that means is the map needs to tell you where exactly is the location of your uh, traffic light in 3D space. And furthermore, it needs to tell you where exactly the light bulbs are in your 3D space. And then you can project that into your camera stream and try to figure out where exactly your, your traffic light is in your camera stream. And you can see how that is not very robust to things like vibrations in your camera mounts, uh, things like uh, roll, yaw, and pitch of your car's posture, and, um, and it can lead to um, misdetections of your traffic light. And that's not good. So uh, some improvements have been made on that. So there has been a hybrid approach where it takes, a, takes the HD map, which, which tell you where the, where the traffic lights are and take that as a suggestion uh, and you can crop out general area around your traffic lights in your camera image and try to use a CNN to detect that. And still, that has a few advantages. It's still not very robust because you rely on a map and also because you rely on a map, you cannot deal with temporary infrastructures or new infrastructures that are not yet inside the map. So we made some experiments. So you can, you can see the um, traffic light detection, uh, traffic, de traffic light detection functions work in AutoWare. And this is um, 
sort of a demo of that. Only if I control the spacebar. And then you can see on the bottom right, it's approaching a traffic light. And I think in a minute you'll be able to see. Uh, it's, so you can see it's running some sort of manual calibration in order to make this work on, on the car. I don't think you can see it very clearly, but there are markers that are being manually calibrated. And, and you can see how this is cumbersome and not very good. So we made some experiments. Um, we discussed on the forums and decided a, a slightly more generalized uh, architecture for traffic light detection. Uh, with this traffic light detection ar architecture, we're able to accommodate the old uh, way of detecting traffic lights as well as the new way. And we want to be able to provide a new solution that is basically um, detecting traffic lights from a whole frame of your camera inputs without ever relying on your map. So you have to run a pretty big convolutional neural, neural network and uh, run that through your whole camera frame and try to pick out within that frame where the traffic lights are. And at the same time, do classification. Um, but for ARM, we're able to make a few modifications uh, in order to make the network run much faster on ARM platforms. So. First of all, we need to make it TF light compatible. So when you make things TF light compatible, it means uh, there's a reduced number of um, operator types that can be more readily accelerated using OpenCL and our machine learning processor. And secondly, we need to do quantization. So the effect of quantization is um, before you're doing 30 two-bit floating point operations. You quantize it to eight-bit integers for all your operations. That means you can effectively do four operations in the time of one clock. That is, OK, four times faster. Uh, and at the same time, you have reduced storage um, constraints for your weights. So pretty big uh, neural networks might be um, a few hundred megabytes in, in size in terms of their weights. You convert them into integers, they are uh, suddenly a quarter of the size. And then thirdly, 8-bit um, integers can be accelerated using our machine learning processor, um, which is going to deliver many, many times speed up um, from just using your CPU and GPU. So we are, we are still training the network. We're still building that into an AutoWare compatible node. And hopefully, we will be able to demonstrate this functionality soon. But then not everything is machine learning. There are also other conventional algorithms that doesn't use a machine learning approach. So uh, Anouk from ATG from ARM, um, um, she ran some analysis on all the nodes that are in AutoWare and find that in, uh, in terms of the non-machine non learning nodes, the most compute intensive is something called LiDAR clustering. So this is the Euclidean clustering um, algorithm that basically groups the points that you, you take from your LiDAR scan. Uh, and once it found a pretty dense group, it will call that a detection. So it's, it's used for detecting pedestrians, detecting cars, detecting buildings and other infrastructure from uh, within your LiDAR image. And, and what this algorithm does is uh, a lot of, um, lot of points, uh, point pair comparisons, a lot of Euclidean uh, distances. Um, it's not fancy stuff, but basically the sheer amount of data you have to uh, you have to process is kind of the limiting factor. So um, what's the strategy for accelerating that? So we d the strategy is simply downsampling. But you have to do it in a way that doesn't affect too much your detection position. 
So in Nokia, she did um, a lot of analysis and find that there is um, there's a downsampling factor that allow you to do reasonable position detection, and but drastically reduce your computational load. And also um, here the the algorithm that's running is KD near a uh, tree nearest neighbor, which is a very conventionally studied algorithm inside computer science, which means there are libraries. Uh, FLAN, uh, FLAN library um, that implements these algorithms, which means you can go into these alg uh, libraries and hand optimize some of the algorithms and speed up the result. And finally, we're going to talk about the NDT matching of localization. Uh, as I said, NDT matching is simply trying to match a LiDAR scan of your environment to a pre-scanned map of your street. So if you're going down the street, you will try to match your current location to a location inside your map. And with that, you can get centimeter accuracy of where you are inside your environment. Uh, the problem with this algorithm is it's written single thread. Um, I think I think you all agree. Single thread performance is probably not ARM's strong suit, so maybe we need to look at how to parallelize uh, parallelize this. Traditionally, there has been a CUDA implementation that help you accelerate some of the bits, um, but that's probably not very useful for our purposes. Um, OpenMP is one of our options. Um, we could look at using OpenMP to accelerate some of these uh, workloads. So, but, but this is a bit that we need to still look at in the future. Um, the, the picture on the right I'm showing is the NDT algorithm actually running on a MPAD EMAC computer. It's completely running on the CPU. Uh, and um, uh, you can see it's pretty much single thread. Um, but it's actually delivering reasonable performance. The, the point of the Ampere uh, EMAC computer is the chip is actually has a TDP of 125 watts, which is comparable to some of the self-driving, uh, dedicated self-driving socks uh, on the market. So we're looking at um, roughly the same amount of power performance but the downside is the EMAC doesn't have um, accelerator infrastructure. So just, just to talk about a little bit about our future work. So we're going to, because we're a founding member in the, uh, in the foundation, we're committed to um, long-term doing a lot of work on AutoWare. And these are the areas we're planning to look at. So Performance optimization, um, the, the, the emergence of SV and SV2 provides a lot of opportunities to vectorize a lot of the workloads. Um, there's, uh, we can optimize things using OB, OpenCL and porting certain workloads onto our machine learning processor. And secondly, we need to look at the memory latency optimization because um, latency is actually a very important part of your self-driving system and whether it will be successful or not. And at the same time, we could look at new algorithms uh, for different functionalities. So we could look at um, neural network-based lane detection. Uh, we could look at more sophisticated object detection algorithms. We could look at... Um, virtual inertial localization, so localization using just your camera. Uh, these are the functionalities that are currently missing inside AutoWare, and we'll be looking at contributing that into the open source community. And also because ARM doesn't have a physical vehicle that we can work on, we'll be heavily uh, working on the simulation aspect of it. So we will be running uh, AutoWare with a simulator, 
and looking at how do you um, integrate different functionalities into running your simulator. And finally, obviously, we've got to maintain um, different um, ARM targets for running AutoWare. And hopefully, when the new um, 96 boards automotive reference platform emerges and the ARM software reference platform is ready, we'll be using some of their work and putting our workloads on there. And with that, I thank you for your um, participation, and we're open to questions. Can I, sorry, can, can I get a microphone? Thank you. Hello. I have a side question. Uh, in traffic detection, uh, how the input, uh, learning input data set be generated? I mean, uh, do you have uh, labeling the, the, the data set? The labeling uh, the object to uh, traffic light, I mean? Yeah. Um, so getting the data is a big issue um, because new network is pretty well understood. You can take you can take um, you can take well publicized architectures, and you can use them to get pretty decent results. Uh, the trouble is, where do you get your training data from, and how do you label it? Uh, for for uh, companies that are actually working on a self-driving vehicle, they obviously have their own vehicle. They record their own data in their own format, and they um, go away and have them labeled. There are uh, startups that will that will label image for few cents each image. Uh, for for my work, because I said ARM doesn't have a car, we rely on the simulator. So hence, I was able to capture images from the simulator. And because we're in a simulator, it's already labeled data that we are capturing. Um, so we don't have really the problem of um, capturing. Uh, 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 labeling the data, the so but that has the effect of um, the models that we train and the functionality. Uh, the, the models that we train is only going to be working well within the simulator, right? If you put the same model on a on a self-driving car in the real world, it will not work. So the reality is we are. We're providing um, infrastructure and framework allow you to just replace some of the bits. Um, you can replace the neural network itself and plug in your neural network that you trained using uh, real-world data uh, into your car. So I think AutoWare as a whole is more like a framework and specific specification rather than actual functionalities that you provide. Um, because if you imagine a self-driving car in in uh, America, it's going to be very different from a self-driving car in Japan. So you will need to be able to uh, replace some of the bits, plug in new bits. But basically, you have this foundation and you have this framework to build upon. Any more questions? Oh, you have a question. Let me get that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a good uh, presentation. So I, I have a question about the, uh, what's it, the uh, position or, uh, what's it, uh, position calculation or some uh, by a LiDAR data? Yeah. And um, yeah, there um, there is already uh, some algorithms and uh, uh, some framework, software framework for CNN or some uh, object detect, uh, detection by a visual uh, data. But uh, it seems that uh, there is no uh, fixed some let's say uh, fr software framework. For uh, the, the lidar uh, position detection or something like that, are uh, there any uh, open source uh, software framework about that? So, for for 
LiDAR uh, for localization using LiDAR, which is try to position yourself within the map, finding where yourself is. Um, there's this algorithm called NDT matching. And the NDT matching is uh, employed by both AutoWare and uh, Apollo to uh, do centimeter accurate uh, local localization. In terms of uh, object detection using LiDAR data, so detecting your pedestrians and your cars around you, uh, there are uh, your conventional approach using Euclidean clustering. So it's just finding clusters within your scan. Uh, and also there are um, a light uh, a CNM approach um, that help you detect your 3D bounding box of objects around you. So I think there are some research papers uh, deal in this um, problem space. Uh, obviously, for object detection, there's always going to be a hybrid approach using camera and LiDAR. And, and somehow sensor views these two inputs and try to find more robustness in your detection. Um, uh, from the viewpoint, I think that from the viewpoint of the, uh, let's say, uh, semiconductor uh, manu manufacturer or something like that, um, they uh, maybe they want to uh, make uh, some uh, accelerator for only not only for the CNN but also the such a uh, localization uh, yeah, algorithm. Yeah. In that case, we need uh, to make uh, such some kind of uh, the replacement of the um, NN or the uh, for the the lidar uh, data uh, processing or something like that. All right. So. Um I think that the, actually the traditional algorithms, uh, they don't run too badly on a CPU. Um, so just put something into pers perspective. Your uh, neural network for object detection, although it is a lightweight network, it takes a few seconds to run on a CPU. So let's say 10 seconds and thereabouts. It's that order of magnitude. And ten, 10 seconds is not real time, right? Uh, but uh, the traditional algorithms, uh, which I just shown on the MPAR, for example, the, the NDT matching actually are on the magnitude of, you know, 20 to 50 milliseconds. So it's actually quite fast. It's already quite fast. Uh, it's when it's when uh, you start to put other stuff in, um, then you become overwhelmed with different tasks and task switching on the CPU. It starts to become a problem. So um, accelerators definitely are needed for, uh, for CNN workloads because 10 seconds is just not feasible. Uh, we don't have uh, SV and SV2 hardware available, but it's feasible that you can accelerate CN nodes on SVE and SVE2, but it's still never going to beat a dedicated um, dedicated accelerator, especially when you're considering the power point as well, because then you are running neural networks repeatedly with a lot less power. Um, but the traditional algorithms, they are actually not too bad on CPUs, and especially you're able to utilize your parallel um, infrastructure. Along, if you run stuff in parallel, it actually can reach your real-time requirements. Thank you. More questions? All right. Then that concludes my um, presentation, and thank you all very much. Thank <laughs> you.